Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our webinar series, SRLC Presents, um, bringing in our speakers and keynotes from the Rural Conference for virtually for your enjoyment. Um, these are every Tuesday at 2 p.m. and are open to everyone. And please help me in welcoming Cindy Fesmeyer. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, so thanks for that introduction. Yeah, I'm just pleased as punch to be here. I wish that we could for real be keynoting, <laughs> that I could meet you people in person and we could chat, but I like this to be conversational. So I'll say if you have questions or something to say along the way, please just go ahead and enter it into the chat. And um, if Yvette will sort of let me know if there's something that I should know right away. Otherwise, she'll save questions for the end. Um, but keep it conversational and don't be afraid to type something into there. So I want to tell you, um, it really is kind of a story about um, a number of years that I spent as the director of the Columbus Public Library here in Wisconsin. So a little library. Uh, in Wisconsin, it's a medium-sized library because we have so many supremely little libraries. My uh, municipal population in Columbus was about 5,000 people, and I served a total service population of about 15,000 people surrounded by uh, rural area and really small farming towns. So um, really similar to, I think, where a lot of your libraries are probably. So in Wisconsin, um, we consider that a medium-sized, and I felt the privilege of having the resources and the staff to be medium-sized. So when I took the job in Columbus, I will say that they had been without a director for quite some time, and they were very excited to get a new library director on board. Um, so there's me. I, I joined the fun, and I came in with one very distinctive quality that everybody knew right off the bat. I was an outsider. I was never going to live in Columbus. I had set, set foot in Columbus for the first time when I went to interview for the gig. It's only a half hour from where I live in Madison, so um, the commute itself is no big deal, but there's a world of difference between um, living near downtown Madison and living in a different county that is primarily agricultural and um, People felt the difference right off the bat. What I felt right off the bat was a distinct tension within Columbus. So about uh, 30 minutes from downtown Madison, so Columbus was little by little over the years becoming a bedroom community for Madison because Madison's getting really expensive to buy a home or rent a home. So for the same amount of money, you can get a big house with a big yard up in Columbus. A lot of people were starting to commute um, Madison during the day, Columbus in the evenings. However, it was firmly rooted in an agricultural and manufacturing tradition. So there was this tension between those two different kinds of populations the traditional folks whose families had been there for generations and everybody knew, um, like there were like eight big family names and everybody knew them because they'd been there forever. And then the new people who had expectations that where they live should be innovative. They should be able to get decent broadband in their home, an interesting ethnic meal at a restaurant they can walk to public transportation. Um, you couldn't get any of those things in Columbus, but that was part of the uh, affordable housing, I think, uh, up there. So there was a tension when I started because I was new and I intended to not move there. And the town itself was feeling a tension. And um, I'm going to just guess and say that this speaks to some of your experiences in the libraries you work in. So. Um, I can't see the chat, but I would like you all to know for each other, if you would enter into the chat if this um, tradition innovation tension exists in your town, so just write tension, or if you're an outsider, uh, you're new, you don't know the people, you commute, whatever. Um, so enter the word tension and or outsider into the chat if that describes your situation in the community that you serve from your library. 
And Yvette, I am going to guess that there's quite a few of those being entered. We have quite a few outsiders and a lot okay. of combinations. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I thought when I started that, oh my gosh, this is such a unique thing. Not at all. You start talking about it amongst people like us, it's really common. So my intention today is just to share my experience in how I kind of rolled along with those two things, the tension and the fact that I was an outsider. So previous to my library directorship in Columbus, I was a, a nonprofit person. I did um, nonprofit administration for 14 years before library school quick and then taking the job in Columbus. And I did a lot of community organizing in my nonprofit time. So community organizing was in my blood. Um, it turns out in library land, we call that community engagement. And that makes an awful lot of sense. Pretty quick into my seven years in Columbus, an opportunity came out through the American Library Association. It was called Libraries Transforming Communities, and they were accepting applications for teams of five people from libraries around the country to participate in a training with the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation. And, um, to learn over the course of a year and a half tools for engaging with your community and then what to do with the information that you learn. I will mention that this was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The point of the entire training was to teach us as library professionals how to strengthen our roles within our communities as leaders of those communities and to grapple with the phrase change agent. Can you be a change agent? I argue you can, and I bet many of you are. So this opportunity came along, I applied, lo and behold, we were accepted. Uh, this is my cohort of five people for the Columbus Library who were trained along the way. They include someone from our library system, a statewide organization, two library staff, and a trustee. I'm just gonna point out um, the shorter woman right in the middle, Mary Lou Sharpie. We're gonna talk about her a little bit later. She's amazing. She's a friend who I dearly miss since I don't work in Columbus anymore. Um, but just, just keep her face in mind because um, she talked to me very sternly later, that, that really nice little lady. These are the 10 libraries that were chosen to participate in the ALA training, Libraries Transforming Communities. They're in order of population. Starting at the top, Red Hook, New York was the smallest with about 2,000 people. Then came me from Columbus, about 5,000 people. To my mind, the gap then between us and Knox County is massive. They served almost 35,000 people in Wisconsin. That's a really big municipality. However, um, when you go to the end of the list and you see we're up with like San Jose and Los Angeles, California, the spectrum was huge and our experiences were very different. And I wanna say, I'm sharing with you the information about the size of the library because it was those smaller libraries who saw a lot more good come from this program and from the engagement they were doing with their community. I truly believe that small is mighty in, in relation to um, working with your community and it's smaller libraries that have such great potential to have really strong working relationships with many, many people in their community. And if you have a great relationship with like 10 or 12 people, community leaders, uh, that's a really different proportion of population in a place that serves 5,000 people or a place that serves 4 million people. Um, so we have the potential to make great change in our smaller communities. So just briefly, let me tell you what the Harwood thing was about. You've probably heard um, Harwood bandied about. I know that the State Library and um, what is it, MCLS, I think, have worked with Harwood yes. in your state. Yeah, um, so some of you have probably done the training. This is the story of my training and um, much past my training, what resulted from it. So forgive me, if you're a Harwood person, you already know this. Harwood focuses on uh, the act of turning outward within your community. So that basically means um, that you are seeing, hearing, and acting on behalf of your community as a change agent. So instead of focusing on your library building, not that we're in our buildings right now, but 
you know what I mean. Um, instead of focusing on what's going on in your four walls or on your lawn or your library program at the park, you're really turning and, and just slightly tweaking your perspective and considering the needs of the whole community, not the, just the folks who work at your library or come into your library on a regular basis. So it's a really slight change in posture just to see um, a bigger picture to hopefully um, make a bigger splash within the community you serve to make the choices on what the library does based on the needs, wants, and aspirations of the whole community instead of just kind of business as usual like you've been doing. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what this does is um, this training gave us tools to have those conversations with our community because it's one thing to say like, be an embedded librarian and be out in your community and um, get involved and um, make sure people see your face. It's nice to have a, a prescription on how to do that and that's what this training did for me. As a new library director, it was also a really easy like excuse for why I was calling somebody or stopping at their office or inviting them to coffee. Um, hey, I have this grant, I need to talk to you about a thing. It's a lot, for me, it was a lot easier to have that excuse than just to say, I'm a new library director, can I talk to you? <laughs> um, so, so consider community engagement that excuse if it's not something that comes naturally to you. And then eventually it may come, come naturally. And in fact, yes, you are the new library director or, or whatever, that's the new elected council person. You just need to meet each other. Um, so the work of engagement can help you do that. It just helps you be proactive and put yourself out there. The, the same with the work, helps you be proactive in identifying potential projects within your community that you can take action on um, so that you're putting the community ahead of the needs of the library in a way, but really they're the same thing. So I had mentioned those tools that help you have those conversations because if you're like me, um, just going up to a complete stranger or standing up in front of a room of complete strangers and initiating a conversation was a little bit daunting. And so these four tools here, the ask exercise, the aspirations exercise and community conversations, these are scripts basically for helping you have those conversations with community members. We're not going to talk about the tools today. Today I'm really going to talk about the outcome of doing that, but you'll notice these are linked. So Yvette will share um, a copy of the slides with you after this and you'll be able to click all the hot links and go check out those tools for yourself. They all lead back to ALA and the work that they did. So um, what you've got here is sort of a, a fast, medium, and a longer conversational script. Um, ask exercise is four questions, aspirations is seven, and community conversation is ten. The ask exercise takes like five or ten minutes and we did it quick on clipboards, um, half sheet papers with the four questions printed out. On clipboards we would go out to community festivals in the summertime or um, programs in the park or whatever and just do like a person on the street survey. That's how we deployed them. The aspirations exercise is something that we did with um, groups who were close to us to start assessing their aspirations. So the library board of trustees, the friends of the library, um, other city department heads, we had that conversation, that like medium length, maybe 45 minute conversation. The community conversation is meant to be with a group of 10, 20 people, and it takes like 60 to 90 minutes. You get very in-depth, and each of um, those kind of levels just gets more and more in-depth, and that's why it takes more time, and the uh, way you facilitate them is a little bit different. Um, but that's just three ways that um, Harwood trained us to engage with our community, to ask them questions, and then to listen closely to what they want. Well, 
Um, you'll remember Mary Lou Sharpie, the little lady from um, the picture of the people who trained with me. She wouldn't have any of it. She said, this isn't enough, Cindy. In this community where she taught for 30 years in the school, she was on the library board. She was the president of the Literacy Council. Everybody knows Mary Lou. She said, in this community, we need something really fast and really visual and participatory. Trust me, this is what we need. So together, um, we had to hatch something that was quick and easy, but specific to our town. So I will tell you that Columbus, its nickname is Redbud City because there's a strain of this really pretty pink budding tree called a redbud. There's a Columbus strain that's one specific to Columbus, so they, they claim it, and those are Columbus redbuds on that picture. Um, and so we decided to play with trees as, as um, our extra thing special that Mary Lou insisted that we do. If you end up doing something like this, which I'll talk about in just a minute, just look around your community um, and some suggestions are to see what the school mascot is. If everybody is a cardinal or a badger or whatever and they identify with that. If you have a, an annual festival that um, your town is really known for a bluegrass festival or a home brewers festival or whatever, um, just just find something that you're known for. And if you want to do a quick and easy thing like this, tie it to that. And that thing is, it was our Root for Columbus campaign. So it was trees, like I said. And on the slide of, of um, tools, of conversation tools, it was four, seven, or 10 questions. Well, this was just one question. And it was a really simple question. The question is, what kind of a community do you want? And so um, we had three instances of a Root for Columbus tree in town for like two or three months. One you can see on the top row was um, the doors into the program room. We just made a construction paper tree and used a die cut to cut out leaves. We did this in the fall, um, fall colored leaves, and people wrote what they wanted for their community and taped it up on the tree. We had another tree on the main floor in the adult section. Um, the Mostly kids did the one that you see here. But the one that we got the most data from was our traveling route for Columbus tree. So um, on the lower right hand corner is a picture of the tree in the elementary school in Columbus. So those are some kiddos answering the question and tying um, their leaves on the tree. This tree was so simple to make. It was literally a Christmas tree stand and a little scrubby tree from um, somebody's land that um, we cut off, stuck in, and every about two weeks we moved the tree around town. So here it's in a school. It went into all the schools. It went into bank lobbies and gas stations and uh, the lobby of the hospital and city hall and coffee shops and bars. It traveled all over. Every week or two we moved it and we ended up collecting hundreds and hundreds of these leaves which ended up being really nice hard data for us because we were able to pull out themes from many, many responses to that single question that just took you a couple of minutes to participate in. And then people started wondering where the tree was gonna be next. So we started getting questions about like, what's up with Root for Columbus these days? And for us, we thought that all it was was the name of the tree. We thought it was just the Root for Columbus tree. Let me tell you about some of the stuff that we heard along the way. So the, the big thing with community engagement is um, it's a three-part process. You ask questions, and those questions are similar each time so that you're asking the same questions and getting the same data. And then you listen. And and I say that that's a distinct skill because it's, it's, it's a skill to be a good listener and um, I know you're all listening so well right now. <laughs> um, but it really is. You know when you're in a meeting, you're thinking about what you have to do when you're done with the meeting. You're thinking about what, what you want to say after that person finishes or what you're feeding whoever for dinner later that night. Um, listening is important. So that's the second part. And then the third part is act. So we asked a lot of questions. We listened closely and themed out the many, many responses that we had from people from asking questions those four ways. And this is what we heard. We heard that Columbus strives to be a welcoming and vibrant community for all. 
and it's a total like elevator pitch, right? So it's really broad. It doesn't actually mean a whole heck of a lot. Welcome and vibrant community for all. It's a typical like vision or mission statement, but those are tr words that we truly heard over and over. And then everybody who participated in this process, um, we reported back to them and we saw that not just this process, but individual organizations around town started adopting that exact phrase, welcoming and vibrant community for all. So this started um, creating a mission statement for like the town. Um, but specifically some of the stuff that we heard is that people wanted a boundary crossing social interaction. They wanted to feel civic pride. And we noted um, on a couple of those um, uh, conversational scripts that I talked about, um, at some point you ask, and this thing that we've just talked about for like an hour that would be so cool for the community, who do you trust to help that happen? We heard crickets. We learned that there wasn't a trusted civic or municipal leader to, to sort of lead the way on, on moving toward achieving the things that people wanted. So that also became something that we wanted to address. And this is what we did. We started with the leadership part. We created a group of grassrootsy community leaders. People, um, the people sitting around this table are um, the owner of a manufacturing plant, um, a retired professor, a graphic designer, a lawyer, an insurance guy, um, a retired person. Um, but they were people that everybody knows, like everybody knows those people in town or, or many people do. And we wanted to raise these people up to potentially be some of those leaders and step into that leadership vacuum that we had heard about. And so the first thing we did was bring potential leaders together and have a conversation. And again, we facilitated it and there was always flip charts or, or something, um, but we started calling them leaders. That was a big deal in Columbus. Together they hatched this plan. They decided that we were going to take that Root for Columbus tree that people were still asking, what's up with Root for Columbus, and we were going to create a new library program to serve the whole community. It was called the Root for Columbus Action Potluck, and it's always action with capital letters because we wanted to make a distinction between the many, many conversations that we had had, people just getting together to talk, we wanted to identify to people that this next phase is different. You come together, we're still gonna talk, but then we're gonna do something together. So we took the resources of the library and we put this program together with that leadership council. The library leveraged its position as a convener. We just, um, could find free places in town to have conversations. We um, found a place, set a time, got some snacks, um, and then we did the marketing um, using all of the library's marketing channels to try and get people there. Uh, together, that group of leaders created an agenda. Some of them got trained in facilitation methods. So the methods that we learned from Harwood and ALA, we turned around and trained some of these people in those same methods. and. Um, we together decided how we would communicate what we were hearing and how we were communicating with like the local paper and radio station and, and that kind of thing um, about what we were doing. So this is an example of library as convener. We just brought people together. We helped make the, the thing that that leadership council wanted a reality. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what the potlucks themselves look like. One, it was a potluck because Mary Lou Sharpie insisted that food had to be involved. Here in Columbus, Cindy, you don't know, there has to be food or the people won't come. So we believed her and um, we're a small enough municipality that we can still have potlucks and not worry about things like sanitation. Obviously that's really different now. <laughs> I fully recognize that all of these things are impossible under COVID. Um, but I'm also working with a group of people right now to figure out how to do these things virtually, to have these conversations virtually within your community. And I'll have more to say within about a year or so. 
anyway, so we had these Root for Columbus action potluck planning meetings. Um, this is how it started. That leadership council started calling itself the R4C Leadership Council, Root for Columbus. So it went from trees to a council to R4C. Um, together ahead of time, they came up with the themes that would be facilitated, the agenda, who was going to do what, who was going to facilitate, who was going to work in a small group, who was going to be a greeter, um, and they decided how we were going to market that. On the themes, uh, there were four regular themes uh, that we defaulted to if we didn't have specific ones, and they were art, environment, whole community, and families. However, we had special circumstances come up within our community now and then and would make entire planning potlucks just about that. So we had a, a dire um, natural storm, straight wind, straight line winds that decimated town for, for weeks and people couldn't get in and out and neighbors got to know each other because they had to share resources. You know, when things get tough, um, people get over their political or religious or educational differences and work together for a common good. So the, the coolest one that we had was how do we continue working together in the way that the storm got us started. We had special themes around um, winter holidays, around summertime when school was out. Um, that was the structure of the potluck. This is kind of the recipe of how the day went. Um, I cannot stress enough how much I am a believer in name tags. So if you want to be engaged with your community and you want people to know who you are because you want them to come to you when they have aspirations that need to be met um, and you want to know what people's names are, name tags are really important. So I like the just the little cheapy packs of a hundred little stick on name tags I brought with me everywhere with a Sharpie. They're very important. Uh, even if everybody thinks they know each other, they don't. Name tags, if that's all you take out of this talk, <laughs> that's great. Name tags are important. We collected everybody's contact information when they came in. They just registered with their, their email, basically, so we knew who was there and how to get in contact with them. We put the themes out on the tables for the small group work. Together, we would brainstorm ideas um, and then break out into small groups to talk about those and then report back. Within those small groups, People had uh, specific handouts that they worked on. Everybody, when they registered, when they first came in, got one of these handouts. We called it our planning guide. And it names things like, what is this about? Who's in charge of this project? Who else is on the team? How do you get in contact with each other? And what do you need from the library to help do this? So people would identify needs, short-term maybe a couple months to tackle it and make a real difference on this thing. Um, they identified needs and over the course of months between that potluck and the next one, they would work on it together following the outline that they created together in this planning guide. So this one is Davies Park part two. And so um, the Route for Columbus folks kind of adopted a little pocket park that had been forgotten by the city. And it was an entrance to the city from the Amtrak station and they made it pretty. So this was the second time that they worked on it. And um, I will say this project really solidified a fantastic working uh, relationship between the library and our Department of Public Works because they supplied us with tools and vehicles and big, big like jugs of water for when we put in uh, new plants and stuff. So um, we would also leverage my adult program's budget line to buy like a flat of impatiens or, or, or whatever we were going to pl plant. We considered this a program. So I can collected statistics just like I would for a program that happened inside the library, how many people showed up on which day, um, and it counted for our annual report statistics at the end of the year too. So as long as it was counting as a program for us, I had no qualms about spending our program budget. I will say in order to do that though, um, I had to stop some of the other spending that we did on adult programming. So um, we used to do a monthly adult craft weekend thing. We stopped doing that and honestly we started doing this instead. Um, our bandwidth was not enough that we could do all of those things. So um, sometimes to engage and get really involved like this, something back at the library has to give. Happily my library board 
recognized that as a as a good thing as a strength of the program and didn't bemoan the loss of the Saturday crafting program which resumed at some point anyway so just to wrap this up I'll tell you what some of those projects were in the upper right hand corner is Davies Park that's us it looks like watering some plants and weeding and doing whatever the community reminisce was a project where um, a Boy Scout troop interviewed um, a whole bunch of old folks on the 100 year anniversary of the park pavilion that is a town center for um, all kinds of social gatherings so old folks talked about the cool stuff they did there their school proms roller skating chicago blues guys coming up um, it was it was really lovely gnomes away from home was a social media scavenger hunt um, the chalk walk was just a a little event that we sort of dovetailed into an existing big community event a chalk art contest with prizes but the big thing I want to talk about is the art benches in the lower right hand corner uh, for the ALA grant we got a little bit of money and I had a little bit left over and I purchased five just blank wooden benches and put them in the hands of five artists around town and um, this one was a collaborative project between a local photographer and a middle school art class and any time the route for Columbus projects ended up with a concrete result that was going to stick around for a while we liked to make sure that the library's name ended up on it so um, I don't know if you can read that but it basically says the artist's name the fact that middle school kids did it and that it was a route for Columbus um, project which was a program of the Columbus Public Library so take credit when credit is due and make sure that people understand the cool work you're doing when you make a difference like this so root for columbus started as a tree became a potluck thing but then it became a point of civic pride so we created these like front yard political signs that just say i root for columbus and every time you participated in a potluck or any of the projects or any of that you got one to bring home and at one point these were all over town it was lovely uh the mistake i made and you shouldn't make if you ever do something like this i you'll see the library is not mentioned anywhere on that sign and that was a missed opportunity there's also not contact information on that sign so we blew it a little bit um, but the next batch we we fixed it up so it started as a tree became a potluck thing but then ultimately it became sort of um, a code word for community change um, people wanting to root for Columbus and we had no idea when we started that it would become this big thing but it did so people recognized that the library was a leader right we had heard that it needed leadership and a lot of the staff from the library stepped into that position by simply convening people and bringing them together well so we kept the conversation going we heard also the Columbus wanted a viable and walkable downtown it has one of those downtowns that's starting to die in small town fashion because there's like a Walmart on the outskirts of town and, and um, you know big boxes on the outskirts and the downtown is dying so people wanted to reverse that trend but we knew that the two organizations that should be integral in re reversing that trend um, they didn't get along very well the Columbus Downtown Development Corp and the Chamber of Commerce um, had some old bad feelings about each other and couldn't like get it together enough to make positive change well we had another trauma like that st straight wind storm um, we had the entire main street of Columbus um, be uh, dug up and reconstructed over the course of a summer and that was like 80% of the businesses in town are on this main street and it was going to be impassable for five months or something terrible terrible um, so we took that tragedy and um, again we convened the library convened a conversation uh, with community partners like City Hall and those two organizations that cared about having downtown be better and um, we uh, created a list serve that was run by the library not by either of those two groups so that people wouldn't um, choose to participate or not based on who was sending out all the emails they trusted the library to do that so we leveraged that and then we helped raise some new leaders within those two groups 
working together. So um, some small business owners ended up being civic leaders as a result of this joint thing. And together we um, they coordinated sales and uh, did marketing about where you could park and what back doors were open, just whatever you need to do to get through something hard like that. They did it together. Not always accomplishing what they set out to, to accomplish, not always getting along, um, but I think better than nothing. Um, and, and it was a nice model to, to share um, with the municipality as well. Another thing we did is partner up with lots of other people to turn the annual holiday train that went through Columbus into a really big event. It's a Canadian Pacific line, an Amtrak line that runs through Columbus. And um, the Canadian Pacific holiday train would just sort of blow through every year and a, a few hundred people would, would watch it go. It's cool. It's lit up. It's at night. It's really cool for little kids and families to go watch. I'm an adult and I liked watching it. Um, but we turned it in to a really big event because we were starting to collect partners all over town. Um, you'll see here an example of some of those partners who participated in this. And um, many of them, it was an easy ask and for them it was an easy yes in response. Um, to partner with us on creating programming around the holiday train coming to town. So it became a whole day event with literally thousands and thousands of people that we'd have to shut down the highway every year and partner with the police and fire. It became a really big deal because people liked each other again and they like trusted each other and they realized that they could do some things together. And the library is increasingly having less and less to do with these things. We're just becoming one of many partners. And um, it was a nice thing to see in action. A last thing that we heard when we uh, did all our information collecting is that Columbus wanted more opportunities for diverse social interaction for people of all ages. Uh, they wanted specifically more stuff for kids and teens to do, and they wanted an organized public space to help achieve that aspiration. So like what organization would be able to do that? The library. So this was a no-brainer. We just gave them all the stuff that they wanted. We started after school clubs for middle schoolers. We started multiple different kinds of programming for teenagers. And we started programming very differently for our adults and um, programming in spaces that were not in the library, that were in bars and the senior center and parks and a pavilion and um, just getting people out and about in town, um, creating like small community events for people to participate in. That was all library stuff. It was easy peasy. It was music to our ears to um, hear people ask for something we knew we could just get done. And we did. However, as we were doing all of this stuff, um, we realized that Columbus was running out of space. People were spending more time together in bigger groups, and they had said that they needed more physical spaces to get together, where bigger groups of people could get together. The program room in the library was quite small. It could hold like maybe 25 people. The senior center isn't huge. Um, there just weren't big places to go that were easily accessible to, to people. And so we took what we heard from our community conversations and built it into the library's strategic plan. And we decided that our library was too small to accommodate community aspirations and community needs. And we decided it was time for us to grow and give them more space. Obviously, it's one thing to identify that need and another thing to actually do something about it. Um, I will tell you now, there is no bigger library at this point. We settled on a stopgap instead. And this is that stopgap. Um, it, it was a library and then a parking lot and a house on this block. The house went up for sale. This is the house. The library board um, managed to purchase it between some of their fu funds, some private funds, and some city funds. We purchased the house and we turned it into the Columbus Public Library Annex. The upstairs was not ADA accessible, so it couldn't be part of the library. Uh, instead, we rented it to artists around town. We turned those bedrooms into artist studios, charged just enough rent for us to be able to pay the, the HVAC costs. And in return for the cheap rent, the artists had to put on programs for the library, for the community, or they had to do public art installations once a year. Um, and then the lower level was shared between community groups, and the Friends of the Library started a static um, 
bookstore, something they weren't able to do in our library. And I, and I know it's been a year since um, I left the directorship in Columbus. I know this building is still growing strong with a lot of community use. Um, everybody always asks, I didn't staff it. It was locked during the day and when a community group was gonna use it, they walked over to the library, got the key, brought it over to the annex and then brought it back. Um, so we didn't have enough staff to actually staff the building. It was not a true annex. It was a part-time when we needed an annex just because we didn't have the money to do that. So we heard things, we listened, we did things together with the community. Ultimately, it was clear that if the library was in fact gonna be part of helping to either us expand or create a combined library community center, whatever the solution to that lack of like public space was going to be, City Hall was not ready to make that decision. They hadn't done very much planning about really big capital expenditures for themselves. So um, the elected officials and city staff weren't comfortable saying, yes, library, we're going to bond or go to referendum or whatever you need to do in your community and we're gonna find the funds and you're gonna expand. They were not ready for that. So what we did together is I worked very heavily with the mayor and the city administrator and um, a citizen council to create to hire a planning consultant to, to walk us through a long-term planning project where we could forecast big needs like a new fire station or a combo library community center or whatever the needs were on a timeline with budgets attributed to them. We planned together with citizens and city people. Um, I was lucky enough to win an IMLS national leadership grant uh, that allowed us to um, really help push this process forward. We brought together um, uh, it was $100,000 to hire that planning consultant. We gave $25,000 of this grant toward that, knowing that the library was such an integral partner in all of this planning. Um, we made sure that we were included and that they actually did this process they wanted to do. The remaining money allowed me personally to devote a lot of time to the planning process. Um, by having paying somebody else to do what was some of my other work like adult programming and marketing and stuff back at the library still a small library i still did lots of things besides be a library director so together we created a, a 30 year plan called the columbus roadmap to 2050 that included that timeline and those budget spreads and created the roadmap uh, when i left about a year ago it was on the verge of being shared out with the community and then the city administrator left and everything ground to a halt and honestly i don't know where they're at with it right now um, but <laughs> no matter what the plan says at this point i'm sure things are a little bit different in this time of covid and and the timeline's changing but at least the bones are there so whenever they're ready to pick things up and go back to business as usual it's all there in writing the council has approved it the town knows about it they're ready to go Okay, so that was a lot. Before I go on to this next slide, I'll just ask if there are any questions along the way of that. We are actually good so far. Okay, great. So I want to leave you with just a few thoughts that I learned um, along the way about being a change agent, about engaging in community engagement. And this is just my personal ramblings. Um, you, are, you are already heard a whole lot of the story. Here's a couple of the takeaways. And that is regardless of how you do it, regardless of how shy or outgoing you are or how long you've been in the job, you need to learn the community's vision for itself by going on regular coffee dates or doing surveys or, or any of the tools that you'll be able to link through through the PowerPoint when you get it. Um, however you do it, you need to know what the community aspires to. While you're doing that, you need to be patient. Um, changing things, being perceived as the person who changes things, that can be hard. And people, some people have trouble with change. Um, I mean, we know that. I, in my library, 
in the first couple weeks as the new director, I just wanted to replace the train table in the children's library because it was shabby. It was loved and it was, the paint was scraped. It was brown and gross. I just wanted to put in a new tra table. People freaked out and the library board had to inform me that I would not be doing that. Um, 